what a thrill it is for me to welcome you to Christmas Eve at Bethany. If you're new, uh, my name is John, and I want to extend a, another welcome to family, friends, extended uh, family as well. If you're with us as part of our online community, we're thrilled that you're connecting with us as well. Uh, what I'd like to do tonight is take a look at uh, one of the events surrounding uh, the birth of Jesus is found in the Gospel of Luke. And Luke, what Luke shows us with Christmas uh, is that the birth of Jesus actually addresses one of our most primal fears. One of our most primal fears. I mean, Christmas is a time of joy for so many people, as it should be. But Christmas is also, for others, a time where the fears and the hurts of life tend to surface. And so when I think about fears, I think about this, uh, this episode that I came across from the Discovery Channel uh, this past week. It was put on uh, a few years ago, and it, it was about a guy who zipped himself up in a Teflon suit uh, because he wanted to be the first human to be swallowed alive by an anaconda. I'm not kidding. This actually happened. I don't know who does that. But they showed this episode of this guy who was preparing himself to be swallowed by an anaconda. Uh, I don't know why that would be the thing that you would want to contribute to life, but that's what was happening. Now, an anaconda, of course, is the largest snake. It grows up to um, up to 35 feet long, and it can swallow uh, uh, an animal of up to 350 pounds. In fact, they're so dangerous that uh, the Peace Corps uh, uh, volunteers were given an instruction book uh, for a protocol if somebody was attacked by an anaconda. I'm not, so, so they were given, for, for those who were going into the, region, the Amazon region, they were given some instructions what, what you need to do in, order, in case you got attacked by an anaconda. And I thought we should walk through that just in case something, you're attacked by an anaconda, it could happen. So let's, let's take, this is what they wrote down, and I can't vouch for the veracity of this list, but apparently this is what was wrote, written down. Number one, if you're attacked by an anaconda, don't run. Don't run. They say the anaconda is fast enough to catch you. I say let the anaconda prove it, right? <laughs> In fact, if I'm with somebody, I don't even have to outrun the anaconda. I just run, I run past faster than the dudes next to me, right? So, you know, truth and love. Don't run. Number two, lie supine and keep arms close to your side and your legs together. Number three, tuck your chin in. Number four, the snake will come and begin to nudge you and climb over your body. Number five, don't panic. If there's ever time that God created an emotion of panic, it's, this would be the situation for it. Number six, the snake will probably begin to swallow you from the feet end first. Do not try to resist. At this stage, it is especially important not to panic. The snake will begin to suck your legs into its body. This will take a long time. You must lie perfectly still during this whole process. Number eight, when the snake has reached your knees, slowly and with as little movement as possible, reach down, take your knife, and very gently insert it into the snake's mouth and between its mouth and your leg, and then suddenly rip up upward and sever its head. Number nine, be sure you have your knife. <laughs> See, there are good fears and there's bad fears, and, and, and this is a good fear because a, a good fear like this one saves your life. A bad fear can paralyze and destroy it. A bad fear can paralyze and destroy whole seasons of life. And today I want to take a closer look at a similar fear, one felt by the Virgin Mary herself, but one that she would overcome. It's the fear of hopelessness. Now let me get a definition of hope so we're working off the same page. Hope, in the Christian sense, is the expectation of future blessings and the confidence that the best is yet to come. It's the expectation of future blessings and the confidence that the best is yet to come. So based off of that definition, I would say that many people in our community this weekend are living without a sense of hope. We have people asking, am I going to be happy ever again? Maybe you've suffered some setback 
in some relationship that's really important to you and it just seems like the best has already happened and you don't have any really hope for the future. Or maybe you've had a setback in your health, maybe it's a job, maybe it's at school, and you look at it and it just feels so incredibly final and you wonder, is there anything left to look forward to? And what we're going to see is Mary faced and overcame the fear of hopelessness. And it's through her example that you can overcome hopelessness as well. Let's go back to the Luke passage. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. Now, here's the first question you should be asking of this text. Why is Mary troubled? Why is she afraid? And the obvious answer seems to be that she, she just saw an angel. Now, angels in the Bible don't exactly look like the ones that we think about in our culture, the kind that are the chubby, harmless kind with a little bow and arrow. You know, the, the angels in the Bible were towering, majestic warriors that were so impressive that those who experienced angels feared for their life. So she was alarmed and feared for her death, not just with the appearance of the angel, but also what was said. He greeted her, O favored one, O favored woman, and she asked, Who am I? I mean, who am I for you to show up in all your heavenly glory with all your attention on me, telling me I'm someone special? I mean, I'm trying to imagine what that must have been like for Mary. Imagine in the middle of this service, suddenly the, the, the doors and the exits uh, break open and a whole dozens of secret service uh, men and women come into the room and they're looking around for somebody. They eventually look at me and say, pardon me, pastor, I'm sorry, but we're looking for blank and fill your name into that blank. And they say, well, we have a matter of, um, of, of an urgency. The president of the United States wants to speak to so-and-so. It's a matter of national security. The response to that is, what, who, me? I mean, well, why am I so essential to national security? I think that's something about what Mary must have felt that night. Who am I that God would send his top secret service agent to tell me that I am someone special and to understand that you are under the gaze and under the direct attention of the almighty God is frightening. That's what Mary felt at this moment. It goes on, you will receive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will, be, he will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Now Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. So this is your second question. Is Mary's question a question of doubt? Kind of. She says, I'm, I'm a virgin, and virgins generally, you know, don't have babies, God. Verse 35, the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used, used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month, for the word of God will never fail. So when it comes to doubt... When it comes to doubt, there are two different kinds of doubt. Uh, both ask questions. There's good doubt and there's bad doubt. There's the kind of doubt that grows out of disbelief that is proud and defiant and it looks inward at itself in bitterness and it says to the promises of God, there's no way this can be true. And that form of doubt dismisses the possibilities of God right away. Then there's the doubt that grows out of humble wonder. It stares upward in awe and it says, how can these things be true? I don't understand God, but I want to understand and I, I want to learn. See, the first kind of doubt is closed-minded. The second kind, the good doubt, is humble. Humble doubts lead you to ask genuine questions, not just put up a defiant wall. Humble doubts are open to belief. See, if you're really asking God from a humble doubt, for insight into who he is and in what is going on, he just might give you the answer. 
You know what's amazing is in, respo in response to Mary's honest, humble doubt, the angel gives her one of the most faith-producing statements in all of the Bible in verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. Who has not uttered that in some form of prayer, some form of that? I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through this, God, but nothing is impossible with you. I don't know if I can handle this situation, but nothing is impossible with you. I don't know if I can deal with what is falling apart in my life, but nothing is impossible with you, God. Do you know the only reason we have that statement in the Bible is because Mary asked an honest, doubting question. And what that means is that when you ask God with humble doubts, not only will God engage your faith, he will bless you with insight, and that insight will bless others around you because you'll take that insight and you'll share it with other people. Many people have doubts. God, why would you? God, why is things the way they are? My question is this. Are your doubts humble? Are they open to the possibility that God very well might answer you? Or another way of saying it, you have doubts, but have you ever doubted your doubts? The problem is not the doubts. It's the heart behind them. Be willing to doubt your doubts. That's what Mary did. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. And after the angel left her, Mary went ahead and crafted this most stunning, beautiful song to celebrate her hope. So using Mary's example, how do you and I overcome the fear of hopelessness? You overcome the fear of hopelessness when you understand and embrace the favor of God when you understand and embrace the favor of God on you. The angel started his command to Mary to not fear by announcing to her that she had the favor of God. It's important. What is the favor of God? I mean, I've heard TV preachers say, look, uh, you know, I, I found a great parking spot, praise the Lord, or, uh, you know, I, I was able to find this house. It was bankrupt. It was, went into foreclosure, and I was able to buy it on the, on the cheap. Praise the Lord, the favor of God. My, my kids finally, you know, they got straight A's. Is, is, is that what you think the favor of God is all about? Think about Mary's situation for a second. She's just been told she's going to be pregnant with no husband in a culture that not only frowned upon it, but punished someone with death for that. The man she loves, Joseph, is probably not going to understand this situation, is probably going to leave her. She's already poor. If Joseph rejects her, she'll be destitute. She might have to beg. She's financially insolvent. She has a ruined reputation. Her most important re uh, relationship is falling apart, and yet she rejoices in the favor of God. How? Because a son is being born to her, a son, the angel says, whose name you will call Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. What if Mary's main problem was not finances or a bad reputation? What if the primary problem was a severed relationship with God? What if the reason she didn't have joy or she didn't have purpose has nothing to do with the size of her bank account or this? the status of her marriage? What if it had to do with the relationship gap with God? And what if God brought to her a son to bridge that gap? See, the fact that her pregnancy essentially puts her under the curse of death and despair is given as a symbol for you and me for why Jesus arrived. You and I, like Mary, we're under the curse of death and despair. It happened in the beginning of the beginning. We inherited it and we participated in every day. All we have to do is look around and look within. But Jesus was born to us and would grow up and take that curse. And here's what Jesus did with that curse. He buried in the grave forever. That's the good news. See, to understand the gospel, you don't get religious, you get freedom. You get freedom from the curse because Jesus would live the life that you and I can't live. Then he would die and take the curse of death and despair that you and I can't overcome, and he buries it forever in the grave. To understand the gospel, you don't get religious, you get freedom. It's why Paul said in Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It is the ultimate gift 
because it's a gift of hope. And the best part about this gift, it's already been given to you. It's already been given to you on this side of the resurrection. It has already been extended to you. And this should reshape the whole approach that you have. I mean, think of it this way. Imagine you get a notice that a relative who you never met, didn't even know existed, and you get a notice that they left something for you in their will, and you thought, well, I never met this person, didn't know they existed. It's probably something um, pretty nominal, a token amount, maybe a couple hundred bucks, so you don't even go. Uh, it was direct deposited in your checking account. You didn't even bother looking for, at it. Uh, and you just go on and you continue to struggle to make ends meet. And then a couple years later, you take a look at the savings account and it turns out that this person had given to you $100 million. All this time you had it. You just weren't living with any awareness of it. See, I'm like that with Jesus. I, I already know that I have it. I just don't feel it. I, I, in my head, I understand it, but I don't operate it from a day-to-day -day basis. And so I pray. God, help me to know what I already know. God, help me until it reshapes my emotions, until all the disappointments and all the pain and all the injustices of the world get swallowed up in the hope of what I have in you, until I willingly take my hands off of all that I have because of what I have in you, until I learn to embrace the favor you have given to me. I don't know what situation that you're in, and maybe you're in a Mary-like situation. I can tell you this, though, that when you open up your heart, mind, and soul to receive the gift that was already given to you in Christ, everything the angel said to Mary applies to you. Do not fear. Because of Jesus, you have found favor with the God Almighty. So believe it. Receive it and begin to walk and learn how to follow. And when you doubt, it's okay to doubt. Doubt with faith, with humility. Until I can say from the depths of my heart, in Christ I, I can give up all that I have because in Christ I already have all that I need. Until I burst into song in my hour of my death when my relationships crumble, when I feel destitute and say I will not fear because a child was born in Bethlehem and therefore nothing will be impossible with God. I will not lose hope because my faith says to me the best is yet to come. That is why we celebrate and make a big deal about Christmas. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you know each of our hearts and you know the fears and you know the challenge it is for us to be able to trust you with all that we have, especially the things that tend to crumble right before our eyes and the fear we have of not having hope, that things are, have already happened and it feels so final. Whatever area, whatever part of our life that we're wrestling with, Lord, will you help us to place it back into your hands so that we can live with freedom? It's not about getting religious. It's about living blessed by you, accepted by you, and free to do that with other people. And so, Lord, I pray for all of us in this room, and I pray for every relationship in this room and those who are connecting with us online, that forgiveness can come fast and blessing can come fast, and that we can feel your presence in a way that reminds us that you're still in control and the kingdom indeed will still come. I pray this in your name.